Welcome to uh, everybody here today. The, the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences is something that in one sense is something new and something different for Kiel, but in many senses it's actually not new at all for Kiel. It's very much about Kiel's heart and soul, what Kiel is about and what it was uh, really exemplifying some of its founding principles, and that is one of the UK's first campus-based universities, but a university that is comprehensive, largely in, in, the, in the, uh, the, the disciplines which it teaches and researches in, uh, but it also was founded on having both academic staff and students and researchers in a very, uh, in, in one single place, a place where they can interact and work closely with each other. And so this conference, which is about interdisciplinary thinking, working together and thinking differently, is really at the heart of what Kiel stands for as a university. And it's a really exciting opportunity, I think, to try and communicate um, both within your subject groups, but most especially, most excitingly, uh, beyond your subject groups. My, I guess my personal experience of interdisciplinary work actually started here at this university in the 1980s when I was an undergraduate here and I did uh, a joint honours degree. In those days you had to uh, uh, sign yourself up if you were doing pure sciences to compulsory subjects um, in another faculty and this was very daunting for lots of lots of indivi individuals. For me it was very exciting because it meant I could do interesting things like music and and other things and ma well maybe not maths but anyway I, I was forced to do maths because they didn't think my maths was good enough when I came uh, to the university. Um, but it, it was a really enlightening experience for me and then I, I left Kiel and I went up uh, and did a, a PhD in the University of Aberdeen and since then I've had a career um, at Glasgow and Edinburgh universities and Liverpool before coming back here to Kiel. Uh, I suppose when I left Kiel that was the end of a little play with interdisciplinarity and I sort of forgot about it for a number of years and then it came back, um, I wouldn't say to haunt me, actually came back in a very exciting way when I was at Liverpool. We were asked to take part in an interdisciplinary project um, by colleagues at the University of Lancaster and I was working at the vet school at Liverpool at the time and I had a phone call that said uh, well we need somebody who, uh, who can work um, with a group of social scientists uh, based up at Lancaster to try and understand, it was at the time of the foot and mouth out out outbreak in, in 2001, uh, understand how animal disease is affecting communities here in, in Lancashire. And I sort of scratched my head and I thought well um, that sounds rather challenging. I'm not really sure if I can help. I don't know anything about social science at all, so my background is, is, is in life sciences, and it was an area I'd really never encountered at all. So um, I, I said, well, I'm not really sure if I can help. And then uh, my colleague uh, at Lancaster said, well, it's a big grant, and it's actually half a million pounds, and you'll get quite a lot of it. And I then thought, oh, well, maybe we'll have a go. Um, and it probably won't do any, any harm. So we, we, had a, we, we started the project. And uh, I have to say, for the first year of the project, uh, I wasn't doing any novel research as far as I was concerned. I was actually learning a different language. I was learning as a scientist how individuals spoke, how they communicated their science and their subject-based work, uh, work in other areas, in area of policy, in area of social sciences. And it was absolutely fascinating and, and, and really opened my eyes, I think, um, to two things. First of all, when you need to think about tackling big problems, problems that are broad-ranging um, in their challenge, then it's absolutely essential that you have those conversations across, across disciplines. And the other thing I learned was that you can only really have, you can only really understand interdisciplinarity by getting your, 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 your boots muddy, as it were. You've actually got to go and talk to people. You've got to interact. And you've got to really uh, embody that, uh, that, that approach to your work with real interactions. Learn the language. Learn the approach of people and understand where they're coming from. And that was a, a really fascinating project. It lasted four or five years and then we had a number of follow-up projects. Now I've not become the world's greatest social scientist by any means, in fact um, a pretty poor one I suspect um, by comparison to some of you, but I have understood as a life scientist, as a natural scientist, the importance of understanding what science means, but science alone, unless it's put in a policy and a social and political context, actually is very limited in its power to transform uh, the lives of all, all of us around here. 
And equally, I hope some of my colleagues in the social sciences understood that actually there are really exciting things happening at the cutting edge of technology, science, technology and medicine that have real challenges for uh, how they are integrated into, into society. And anticipating those technological changes, knowing a bit about what's down the line in terms of technology is absolutely vital if you're a social scientist or someone who might want to be involved in that political debate about how we as a society embrace new technologies. So those were my two, uh, my, my two lessons uh, over my research career. Today we've got not just social scientists and life scientists, we've got uh, students and staff from a whole range of disciplines. So there's a, there's a lot of other types of conversations that I think can happen today. So I hope you've got from what I'm saying this morning by way of introduction is that this is something different. This isn't a regular poster competition or a regular poster um, afternoon in your normal subject-based areas. This is where your primary responsibility is to communicate outside your discipline, to tell people who aren't don't understand your language, might have a bit to learn about your approach to work, uh, just how exciting your work is, and understand what implications your might work, work may have for their particular subject area. So I'm really looking forward both to talking to you this afternoon, um, looking at your posters, and also hearing about some of those, some of those, uh, those conversations. So, it's not a normal competition, uh, sorry, or rather a normal uh, uh, poster afternoon, uh, but it is normal in the sense that we are going to have some prizes for the posters. Um, so the, uh, and, and the, the, those prizes against a slightly different criteria, again, to your subject, um, uh, your, 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 your subject area, uh, they are about how well your poster communicates to the wider area. And that's what uh, we've got some judges, I hope, placed somewhere out in the audience who are going to go around and uh, come to a conclusion at the end of the day. It's a bit of fun, but there's a real prize, and we will be giving out some real prizes, which are, uh, oh, 100 pounds in Amazon. Can we afford that? <laughs> yeah. Apparently, £100 in Amazon vouchers um, for the first prize, um, and the other is the People's Prize, which is £50 in, in Amazon vouchers. So uh, we look forward to having a bit of fun this afternoon um, uh, giving those out. Just um, before I uh, uh, finish, just a brief um, word about um, some conference amendments. The times are slightly different than they were um, in your initial programme, um, but at 1 o'clock... Um, the conference is open to, to all the visitors. We're going to have some lunch in just a while, which um, I'm sure you're all looking forward to, a chance to chat to each other over some refreshments. Um, and then from 1.45 to 2, we've got refreshments. Um, from 2 to 2.30, we've got some three-minute thesis presentations. I've never seen a three-minute thesis presentation, so I'm really looking forward to, to hearing those, I guess. Stick your hand up if you're doing one of those. There's a few, yeah, so we've got some in the audience. So... so that's at um, uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon. Um, and then at 2.30 to 3 o'clock, uh, we've got half an hour. Um, David Amagoni, um, our Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise, is going to uh, be speaking um, in a... Uh, I, I, actually, I won't try and preempt or even suggest what you're going to speak on. Um, I know it'll be interesting and exciting, and it'll certainly be interdisciplinary. And then at three o'clock, we, we finish up with just a brief um, uh, a prize giving session and, and, some, and some closing remarks. So, um, thank you very, very much for, for coming. We're going to enjoy some lunch um, in, in just a moment. Um, but before we do, do that. Uh, I just want to emphasise that this is very much a collaboration between the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences um, and all the members of that institute, which include all of you by the nature of the fact you're here, but also some of the people that take leadership um, in that institute. And one of them is a very important uh, member of that team is our president of the Keel Postgraduate Association, John Granger, has been very much involved in inputting things that postgraduates would like to do into the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences. And we've had a number of talks suggested by him. I know a number of you have been engaging and, 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 and attending those. John is actually standing, well, come to your end of office fairly soon. So uh, we're not, we're, we hope very much that your, your, your successor will take on, take on this role. But uh, just pass over to John just for a couple of minutes just to uh, welcome you here. And then we'll um, go to lunch and poster viewing. John.
Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name's John Granger. I'd just like to welcome you here on behalf of the Kiel Postgraduate Association. Um, I think the turnout today uh, is absolutely wonderful, and I think it really demonstrates um, the kind of um, community we have at Kiel. Um, we have a thriving postgraduate community, and I think it's demonstrated not only by uh, the people here today, but the events that kind of happen uh, around at the university, like the postgraduate coffee morning, the research forum, uh, the people we have coming uh, to see us at the KPA and the KPA clubhouse, um, and also the number of students we've seen at the Institute's Grand Challenges uh, lectures. And we also get a fair response from students uh, for the KPA bursary. We always get a lot of people looking uh, to do events like, um, or to attend events like uh, this um, at different universities and different organisations across the world. And I think we're very lucky at Kiel to uh, have the kind of investment in um, these sort of events and organisations that we do. You know, for instance, the KPA, I mean, we have more organisations like the KPA or, uh, opening up across uh, the country, um, you know, organisations dedicated to supporting uh, the needs of postgraduates and representing them within their universities. Um, but it's not everywhere, and it's something that's very important because... Uh, we act as a conduit between the sort of student body and um, the university as a whole. And, you know, we get students' views across and we, um, you know, we really try and get students involved uh, in the events that are happening. Um, and there's going to be a lot more events uh, like this this afternoon. And the KPA and um, the Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences very much wants uh, students at the uh, centre of it. So... Events like today are very valuable, um, and I think you know people underestimate uh, you know the benefits that it brings to their careers uh, as well as their kind of academic development. It gives you a chance to talk to people that you might not necessarily come across in sort of day-to-day -day academic life and learn um, learn things about different approaches to contemporary issues. Um, and you know, it, you know, it produces networking opportunities, opportunities to collaborate, and you can you know raise your own profile uh, as well as your organisations. So we've got funding available at Kiel for um, students that would like to go to other organisations and present. So if you go on the KPA's website at kpa.org, uh, you will see a link to our bursary. So you can apply for between fifty and five hundred pounds. Um, you know, for anything that is uh, kind of peripheral to your study, anything that's going to kind of contribute to your course study. So, in closing, uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Uh, if there's any kind of undergraduate finalists in the room, I think it would be a very good opportunity to talk to um, PhD students, you know, other uh, students at the university, as well as uh, staff members. And if anybody wants to speak kind of more generally about postgraduate study here at Kiel, feel free to come and speak to me. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I can definitely point you in the right direction. So I hope you all enjoy this afternoon. Make sure you speak to people around you and learn from each other and uh, enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to, um, to speak at, uh, at, this, at this event. And my title is Beyond Disciplines, Poster Impact, Patrick Geddes and the Science of Society um, Then and Now. Um, it is about moving a building, actually, um, because when I, when I first, when I, when, I, when I looked at what was said about this talk, it said, um, and David Amigoni will give an inspiring talk. And I thought, oh my God, you know, how do you, how do you inspire people? Um, well, there's nothing more inspirational than moving a building. Um, and, and, and so the movement of a building in London between 1908 and 1910, in the interests of a programme of intellectual and social reform, is the topic of my, uh, of my talk. And Patrick Geddes, who was um, a fascinating um, pioneer of what we would now call interdisciplinarity, was right at the centre of that story. But I want to start off by thinking about grand challenges. Um, what are the grand challenges now? Because ILAS, the Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences, sets itself to contemplate the grand challenges 
And we could say that the grand challenges consist of um, an environmental challenge, the need to find new clean sources of energy, um, the challenge of poverty, poor health and the need for urban regeneration, the challenge of, um, of, 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 of managing and enhancing the experience of an ageing population, and also the very business that we're in, the business of education, um, which is designed to deliver equality and mobility, um, but which has within it unresolved tensions um, around, those very, uh, around those very aspirations. And the solutions? What are the solutions? The solutions, I guess, um, focus very much on ideas about scientific knowledge as a driver of progress, but also um, the importance of art and the aesthetic as a source for improving everyday life. And again, to go back to education and our own sphere of existence as an important contributor to these aims, universities as places of inclusive learning, breaking down barriers of class, gender, international distinction. Now, I seem to be talking about now, but I'm also talking about then. And by then, I mean the late 19th century, the early 20th century, um, when Patrick Geddes was active. And so this is a story that um, is drawn from, uh, from the archive um, of, of, of Kiel, and my thanks to Helen Burton, uh, the archivist, for helping um, in, putting this, uh, in putting this together. Partly what this talk does is to, I think, give a, a kind of a perspective on a problem um, from the past with which, we still, with which we still work. But part of, the, um, part of the aim, I think, is also to illustrate something of the kind of resources that we have at Kiel to facilitate the kind of research that I specialise in, which is um, historical and cultural research about the past. Um, and that, of course, can enrich our understanding of the interdisciplinary challenges um, of, the, of the present. Okay. Patrick Geddes. They talk about inspiration. I don't think I will provide inspiration for you, but Patrick Geddes, as you can see from the facial hair, is exactly the sort of person who set himself up, in a sense, to be an inspiring um, figure. He didn't so much um, propose to submit papers to research committees. He wanted disciples. And you can see that, I think, from, the, uh, from, 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 his, from his look. They're reading a book, but gazing into the distance, seeking to recruit you um, to, his, to his cause. Um, Patrick Geddes was... Um, I'll talk a little bit more about his, his, his kind of intellectual makeup and background um, in, 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 in a moment, but he was central in a way to defining uh, what might have been classed as the science of society in the, the later part of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. It has a really kind of complex and protean um, existence. So something about Geddes' um, science of society... Um, he was deeply committed to Lamarckian evolutionism. So evolution, um, biological and social, was central to his, uh, his vision. And in common with um, Lamarckians, as, as opposed, I guess, to, um, to, 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 to Darwinians, was his assumption that organisms adapt to their environments, that they actually display um, a degree of uh, willfulness um, in, in, in doing so. So this was an evolution that was very much about um, agency. Geddes also um, outlined a social program of what he described as civics. Civics. It was a kind of thing that still hovered around the curriculum when I was undergoing my um, secondary education, and we did things called civics, although it was rather different to, um, to, 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 to the kind of uh, enterprise that, that Geddes had in mind. What Geddes meant by civics was a blend of eugenics, obviously now a very controversial um, programme of social action, 
population management and control of the kind proposed by Francis Galton from the middle of the 19th century and extended by um, Carl Pearson into the into the 20th. So eugenics was a part of, um, of, 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 of civics, but so also was environmental improvement. And I think that's where uh, Geddes is a rather different figure um, to, to Galton and those who followed him. Galton and Pearson tended only to focus in on um, innate um, genetic preference. Um, they didn't really see the need for, um, for, for, for social improvement in quite the same way that actually genetic improvement would usher in um, the social improvement. Geddes was committed to both. Um, in fact, one of the uh, one of the one of the, the things that he's very um, well known for is town planning um, as a as 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 a discipline. He's got many kind of adherents from different disciplines uh, in the higher education in the higher higher education sector. He also, uh, along with those who followed him, outlined the need for new non-polluting forms of energy. And um, this is why the kind of then and now um, parallel is quite an interesting one to, um, to follow. Geddes and those who, um, who worked with him saw themselves as um, sitting at the end of what he described as the paleotechnic um, age. That's a, an age devoted to coal and its burning. Um, and they sought to move to what they described as a neotechnic um, age of, 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 energy, of energy, energy production that was much more um, concerned with electrical, um, electrical power. So that kind of search for, uh, for new forms of energy and their sustainability was an important part of his programme. He was also interested in localities as centres um, of, of, of cultures. And, and in that sense, universities um, became important contributors to and leaders of localities, in his view. Geddes was coming out of a system which had been dominated um, by, in, in Britain at least, two, um, two, two, two providers of higher education, Oxford and Cambridge. Um, whereas in the late part of the 19th century into the early part of the 20th century, many more institutions are opening up uh, within localities um, in places such as Liverpool, in Manchester. The big industrial cities are beginning to lead through higher education as well as, uh, as, as, as industry. And this is an image of the moving building um, that I want to that I want to talk about uh, in this in this in this talk. This is um, Crosby Hall. Um, Crosby Hall was um, established uh, from from the 1460s um, in Bishopsgate in East London, and um, the point about Geddes's uh, ambition, his aspiration, was. In, 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 in light of its, um, its, its imminent destruction, going back to Jonathan's point about how he removed a building in, uh, in, in Liverpool, uh, Crosby Hall, as, a, as, as, a, as, as, as a, uh, an, a, a valued building, the oldest um, uh, d d domestic medieval building in London, was actually demolished in 1907, 1908. And that's um, Crosby Hall today. It's now become a private residence, but for many years um, it was, um, well, it is, of course, still really located um, on Cheney Walk, on the, uh, on the banks of the, uh, uh, the, the, the River Thames um, in, uh, in Chelsea. And uh, for many years, it was um, a women's hall of residence attached to the University of London. And it's... Geddes, who played an important role in securing for it um, that position. So just a few words, really, uh, about uh, Crosby Hall, just to put a little bit more detail about it, on about it and why it was so, um, so, so, so important. Crosby Hall, as I've said, was established, built in the 1460s in, 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 in the city of London, in the east part of the city, and, and it was particularly um, important to um, the project that... 
Geddes was able to build around it because of its associations. Uh, it was associated with that great Renaissance humanist, um, Sir Thomas More, who'd resided in Crosby Hall between 1523 and 24, so before he fell out with uh, Henry VIII and, and was beheaded. Tradition has it um, that More finished Utopia, that great tract um, about uh, progress um, that's become really central to um, the, the humanist tradition both within Britain but of course beyond throughout Western Europe and, 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 and beyond. So there are very big powerful significances attached to this place and what was supposed to have happened in it. So, as I say, by the, late 19th, uh, by the late 19th century, the oldest surviving medieval building in the city was under huge pressure from developers. It was on a wonderfully valuable piece of land, which, um, which banks and, 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 and those who were um, kind of taking over the city in a, in, as a financial sector wanted to capitalise on. So it was demolished by the Chartered Bank, uh, which purchased the land, but... Geddes persuaded them to treat it with great care. So who was Geddes? Just a little bit more detail about him and why he would have come to this particular, um, this particular conclusion about this building. Patrick Geddes uh, was born in 1854, had a long life, died in, in 1932, and he was a Scottish what we would call an autodidact, in many ways trained in his own um, traditions, was originally sent to work in a bank, um, but then abandoned that, and went off to London to train first as a biologist with the great Victorian T.H. Huxley, and that included working uh, at a marine research station in France. But also, in doing that, um, worked increasingly across a whole range of disciplines, starting from a kind of biological, um, biological angle. Um, he invented um, sociology in Britain. Um, he was behind the publication of the sociological papers, which started to appear um, in, in, in 1904. And the sociological papers became, um, a little later in that decade, the Sociological Review. The sociological Review is still being published today. So we're talking about a kind of a, a long history of, um, uh, of, 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 of distinguished contribution to uh, a field and, and, and interdis the interdisciplinary study of, uh, of society. And in fact, Sociological Review still has quite a close connection um, to this university. It's how we came by all this archival material that I'm going to share with you this afternoon. What Geddes did was to develop what he called the regional survey as a way of understanding that complicated historical and cultural relationship between organisms and their environments um, in the way that they were studied uh, and in the way that they were studied then they can now be thought in that, so that same sort of way now. So we're thinking really about the relationship between a place that Geddes particularly valued and how it might be reinserted into, uh, into a, new situ a new situation in, um, in, 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 West, in West London. So the Crosby Hall project of 1908 to 10, uh, Geddes' aspiration was to bring the dismantled Crosby Hall to Chelsea and to rebuild it in proximity to Sir Thomas's, to Thomas More's uh, Chelsea Home and Garden because um, More had associations with Chelsea as well. And bearing in mind the importance that Geddes attached to university education, it was linked to a scheme to develop university residence residences for women postgraduate students and um, it was also bound up with a plan to improve the urban fabric um, of the Chelsea area. Now we think of Chelsea today as, 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 as wealthy, the royal borough of Chelsea and Kensington. In the 19th century it was a much more mixed um, area. There were differences between north and south. In fact if I just show you that 
you might think that that's the kind of thing we normally show when we're talking about so Stoke on Trent, um, and it is the kind of the, the kind of image that we normally see. But in fact, it's it's an area of North Kensington in the uh, early part of the uh, 20th century, used by Geddes as a way of persuading local authorities that his plan was important to regenerate um, this particular this particular area. So. Um, that's what I'm talking about when I say that um, Geddes' vision required money um, and influence, and it also required poster impact, and which is why I wanted to reflect a little bit on his activities in, this, in, in the context of this afternoon's work, the work that you've been doing in putting together um, posters. This image um, that I'm focusing on here was actually used as part of Geddes' poster campaign um, to engage local authorities, but including the um, big um, urban municipal authority, London County Council, which had come into being from the, um, from the, 18, from the 1880s. So here's an example of poster impact from our um, survey, from our, sorry, from our archive. And I think you'll probably agree that many of the visual techniques that are available to you now um, and from what we've seen this afternoon enable you to create um, some really stunning visual effects which weren't so open um, to, to Geddes at this point. Probably not entirely clear to you, but this is Chelsea, a collegiate city. And Chelsea as a collegiate city um, would be cohered, brought into being by bringing um, Crosby Hall into, um, into Chelsea. Um, and you can see the images of, uh, of Crosby Hall to be rebuilt on the site of uh, Moore's Garden in Chelsea, uh, surrounding this pamphlet um, that, uh, that, 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 Geddes was, that Geddes was using. And I want to just spend a few moments just talking a little bit about the importance in this period of history um, of exhibitions and displays. Because since 1851 and the Great Exhibition, there was a vogue for exhibitions and displays. Um, in fact, Geddes regularly took his work to continental Europe to be displayed at expositions, and he worked actively on how to give them an afterlife, a legacy. And the particular example, I think that's very powerful, is the Paris Exposition of, uh, of, 19, of 1900. And as I've indicated, um, Geddes took his campaign to rebuild Crosby Hall in Chelsea um, to local authorities, um, student associations, including this, the, 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 the rather well-titled Utopian Society, um, which were, were, were key to taking forward his, um, to his, 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 his vision. And you can see here from one of the many pamphlets that we, uh, that we hold, um, a record of the meetings to which, um, to which Geddes took his, his campaign, and also the associations of the, with the humanist uh, Thomas More that, dr that, 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 that drove it. Another example of the, uh, the poster work um, that, uh, that, Geddes was, uh, uh, that Geddes was producing, you've already seen this image. Um, derelict bits of North Kensington, but here is the the after, um, the, uh, the, the 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 land that uh, that Chelsea will become um, following uh, fo fo following following the move of this building. This isn't a particularly great reproduction, but it shows its kind of its intended poster impact. But just to give you a sense of the. There were a lot of there were a lot of devotion, a lot of visual uh, attention was paid um, to this to this kind of vision that uh, that Geddes was that Geddes was outlining. So there we have it. Um, this is uh, this is that same scene transformed um, by um, by social reform, social reform led by um, an inclusive form of education. I'm coming to the end now, so. I've got here um, three words scribbled by um, Geddes in the course of his, um, his work on this project. Biosphere, politosphere, 
and Cosmosphere. Geddes was an inveterate scribbler. He was always um, uh, trying to think his way through particular configurations of disciplines and the powers associated with them by coming up with what we might describe as neologisms, new forms of language, new word coinages. Neither cosmosphere nor biosphere were new um, terms. Biosphere comes, around, comes into usage from around about the, um, the, 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 the 1870s, and it's used first of all by geologists to talk about um, the sphere of activity within, or the sphere of space within the Earth in which, um, in which, in which, the, um, uh, in which life is, is active. Cosmosphere was also actually a navigational uh, device. Politosphere um, is a rather um, different concept, and it seems to me to be um, uh, Geddes's own coinage. And how would I then kind of conclude from this, and what would I say about this moment of scribble and what it says to us about what Geddes was trying to do? Well, moving a building is thinking big, and he did it. Uh, he moved the building, other people were involved. It became what he intended it to be, um, a women's hall of residence, which appealed, um, which was designed particularly to accommodate international women students um, as well. But what's interesting, I think, about the conjoining or the placing together of biosphere, politosphere, and cosmosphere is that it shows um, Geddes thinking big conceptually across disciplines and across domains of ideas. But acknowledging, and I think this is an important acknowledgement, the inescapable nature of the politosphere as we try to do interdisciplinarity, because I think that's our biggest challenge. Because when people think about the grand challenges um, today, um, they are thinking about the high degree of connectivity with other problems, making them Im effectively impossible to isolate. Think about the considerable uncertainty and ambiguity about the problem and the solutions, including poor quality or missing um, data. But the, perhaps the biggest challenge is about the multiple value conflicts and ideological, cultural, political, economic and other constraints that might actually um, prevent us from putting in um, a project proposal and getting it accepted. But it might also enable us to move buildings and to move mountains if we get it right. So thank you very much for your attention.